Advancing women and girls' rights is not solely a women's issue. It's an issue for everyone. Men and boys have a huge role to play in the mission to achieve gender equity. I'm honored to have with me a great champion of girls' education in Nigeria and all over the world, His Highness Mohammed Sunusi II. Your Highness, welcome, and thank you for being here. We're thrilled to have you join us as part of our International Day of the Girls celebration. Thank you, Christina. I'm honored to be here. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about your educational experience. Among the many roles that you hold and have held, you are a scholar with interests and expertise in a wide range of topics from economics and finance to religion and philosophy. What was it that set your mind on fire as a young person and set you on this path of deep and lifelong learning? My mother comes from a family of scholars, religious scholars. Um, they're all um, Islamic Qadis and Imams and professors. And uh, my father um, was one of the first generation of princes in Kano to go to Oxford, to go, uh, to, go to the foreign service and basically um, have um, higher education. So um, I grew up um, basically being told that the most important thing in life was to have an education. Um, it wasn't uh, being born into a family. It wasn't even having a position. Um, it was um, having the kind of knowledge that defined you and formed your character uh, and gave you a sense of direction and um, a, a locus in society. Um, so for me, the pursuit of education has been a lifelong thing. Um, and um, having been an economist, um, again, drawn by the influence from my mother's family, I went into the city of Islamic law. Uh, as I speak now, I'm in Bordeaux, I'm studying French. Uh, and in, at the end of September, I start writing a PhD in law at SOAS in London. Uh, and I'm 60, so I, I, I mean, I, I'm, still, I'm still a student. When in your own journey, um, did you first begin thinking about the power of educating girls to join whole communities? Was it something that you grew up thinking about or as you were just mentioning, was there a moment in which society confronted you and it was a, a, an aha moment for you? Um, no, I, I think that I grew up with it. Um, although certainly I can think of a number of um, experiences that would have uh, basically affirmed that view. And the reason I grew up uh, with it again was because uh, um, my, my parents had uh, this focus on it. I have an elder sister who's four years older than me. Um, and the tradition in the Kano royal family was for girls to basically get married immediately. They completed secondary education, uh, some after primary education. And, and I remember uh, my father, who was then our ambassador to Belgium, insisted that his daughter was going to university against the wish of his parents. Um, so my sister was the first female graduate um, in the entire Kano royal family. But that was because my father insisted that his daughter would go to university and she was not going to get married after secondary school. Um, it was a big problem at that time, um, as you can imagine. Now, of course, all of them, uh, all, our, all our daughters, everybody, but at that time, uh, for a princess to go to university was, um, oh, it, it was unheard of. Um, and, um, and, and very revolutionary and radical. So, uh, so again, um, I grew up in a family where um, uh, my father believes that his daughters and his sons uh, should all have that education and it was natural for me. Uh, but then as I um, started going through life, I came across uh, instances where, and I'll give you one instance where a cousin of mine who had gone uh, to King's College with me, who had uh, gone to university with me, um, and then we set up families and, uh, you know, as a, as a young person, you want to pay for a very good education for your children, but then you've got a budget problem. And I was complaining to him about how um, I then had a son and two daughters about, how, about, about school fees. And, and, and he said to me, well, you know, why don't you just let your son go to the private school and send your daughters to the public school? Mm -hmm. and, and, I think, and I think for me, that was like a light bulb moment that somebody who was educated, somebody who had gone through university, was actually thinking that I should give my son a good education and not give my daughter. And, and, and I think that was for me when I realized how deep rooted this cultural problem was. And it wasn't just about uh, poor uneducated people, that there was a general mindset problem 
what do you see as the most effective way to change those cultural attitudes? I think for me, um, and I'm not sure I've succeeded entirely because uh, I have uh, met a lot of resistance and, and there, there are still people who don't agree with me. But I think for me, um, it was about strategy. And, and the best strategy to adopt um, when dealing with cultural practices is to ensure that you do not come from this arrogant perspective of coming to civilize people, but rather speak to them from within their own traditions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so for me, um, if you want to address the issue of child marriage, if you want to address the issue of arbitrary divorce, you want to address the issue of, of women's rights in general um, to a Muslim community, you go back uh, to what other Muslim countries have done. You go back to sources that they trust. You go back to the Quran. You go back to the tradition of the Prophet, and you bring their attention to the fact that the manner in which they treat their women is actually not consistent with the manner in which the religious imperative is that this is really cultural. Uh, it could have been historical. It could have been a misunderstanding. It could have been a product of uh, a particular social and historical context which has changed. And accepting this change is not inconsistent with Islam. Um, and the great thing is you've got countries like Malaysia, countries like Morocco, countries like Tunisia, countries like Egypt um, that have um, made the effort to uh, introduce legislation and policies to improve the condition of women. And you're then able to engage with scholars and show them that Muslim jurists in other parts of the country using the same sources you rely on have seen that there is room for, um, for, for these changes. I know you're very involved in improving teaching and the education system. You are the chair of the advisory board of One Million Teachers, uh, an organization that is improving uh, teacher training in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. Um, can you tell me what you think needs to change? What is it that teachers need and what is it that One Million Teachers is doing to, to fill that gap? Well, I, th I, I think the primary thing is, um, I mean, obviously for everything you, you, you need to do, you need to ask the, the central question, uh, what is this profession? I mean, it, it, I mean if, you, if you're a medical doctor, apart from um, having studied medicine and knowing all the science, there's still the fundamental question, what is a doctor? I mean, who is a doctor? And, and, I, and I think um, that's an important question. Who is the teacher? The teacher is not just someone who stands in front of a class and teaches um, uh, numerous here and, I, and, and literally the teacher is a role model, the teacher is a change agent, the teacher is a leader, okay, the teacher is a servant of people, teachers are not well paid but teachers do it because they have a passion and they want to influence and uh, a whole generation of people and be part of that process, okay, many of us have gotten to places where we're much better financially than all the people who taught us but they can look at us and be proud of having been part of the process that made us what we are. And that is where they get their satisfaction. Um, now, um, I think for one million teachers, it is about improving the technical skills. Yes, people, if you're teaching English, you should know English. If you're teaching uh, math, you should know the math that you're teaching. But also, uh, what are the tools? How do you actually teach? What, what, how do you get children to learn? And beyond... Um, numeracy and literacy, how do you affect their lives? How do you influence their attitude towards an education? How do you make sure that after this class, they're going to develop an interest and continue going on to the next class? Look, women are half of humanity. And uh, I, I keep telling people that, you know, uh, half of humanity is female and the other half was born by females. So, so you, you, you can't, you can't ignore that. You, you can't, um, there, there is no way you will ultimately have to come to the conclusion that the woman has to be the center of your development. Well, Your Highness, thank you so much for this conversation this morning. I greatly appreciate it. You are an inspiration uh, to all of us. And thank you for, your, for joining us this morning. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for all your work. Uh, I'm happy to see um, what you're doing with One Million Teachers in Northern Nigeria. I do hope we'll continue uh, working and collaborating. And I'm hoping that our own projects will continue to uh, go across Africa. Thank you.